we can move on in our program. Now, I would like to welcome another guest, speaker Luisa Bubanova, who is already with us. In her contribution, she will present where the use of emotions is already over the line. I would briefly like to add that Luisa is intensively involved in Euro marketing and emotions, and she has come up with a number of startups. You may have called one of the more well-known ones, Emotion ID. I'll leave the rest to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. My presentation is based on when the use of emotions is over the line. So it's a kind of ethical code of how technology is used, how deeply it can affect our lives and how little we perhaps even know about how people make decisions and therefore how they can be manipulated. So I would start at the very beginning. In 2015, we have invented a technology that recognizes human emotions. We call it emotional AI. Based on some different techniques, we can read the micro emotions and reactions of a respondent to a given stimulus through any camera, a phone, laptop, or a camera built like this one. Now, a small approximation of what it is and how we got to it. The first moment is that we find on a camera or by computer learning the most important points of the face that describe the facial features like eyebrows, eyes or nose. We have also discovered that when women have Botox, we can detect it pretty quickly, so, you know, they don't fool us on that. These points serve as clues and determine the six basic emotions plus the neutral stage or state by facial movement. And uh, we had an interesting collaboration with the Faculty of Psychology, where we trained 12 psychologists with the so-called Paul Ekman approach to emotions. They were our staff who did nothing but look at pictures for half a year and say, you know, this is a smile, this is a smile, this is unhappiness, and this is fear. By doing this, we were able to train our machine on so-called wild data, which ensured a high probability that the computer would correctly identify a given emotion. And probably the coolest thing we've been able to do in this development is the artificial intelligence that can compute parts of the face. The easiest way to do that is if a person were to hold their face up to the camera, you know, like that. But by being able to train that data very well, we were able to compute artificial intelligence that can also recognize emotions uh, at different angles. So for example, when I hold my hand like this, which people do very often, or when someone has a beard or glasses. These are funny things that you often don't even realize, but glasses are a reflection and that can sometimes completely confuse the computer. So, these are the technological things that I'm proud of that we've been able to accomplish. Truth be told, with our software, we can detect several things. In addition to emotions, there's also the age, gender, race, and we use those metrics to determine the different sentiments of the respondent. From the basic emotions through intensity, engagement, we calculate different things like attention span, which is actually the amount of time the respondent is interactive with the content. And these are really important metrics. For example, when we were editing different trailers, it was a very important moment where we knew that for men, we had to go to 20 seconds, but for women, we could easily go to 20. They made it. Of course, it also varies by age and other things. Nonetheless, it's a really interesting metrics, in my opinion. Another interesting metric is the heart rate, which you can read off the camera. Because when the heart beats, the blood flows to and from it. And when it flows to the heart, we are green, which I think it's funny. Yes, even that kind of cue can be read when the camera is good quality. Uh, so when the heartbeat is added to some emotional reaction, the engagement is even higher. Here we can see the six basic emotions that have been described for 100 years. Probably uh, the most famous description was published by Paul Ekman a few years back, and there's a TV show, Lie to Me, based on this. I'm not sure if you know it. Anyway, 
it's a very interesting moment when we realize how we're terribly similar to each other and predictable. And this is what all the search engines and social networks already know about us. Another interesting thing is that compassion is an emotion that is not encoded in us like all the others. It's something we have built up as a society, you know, it's that I'm sorry, facial expression that is still in experimental mode, but we are trying to figure out if it's even definable or if it's just random images. So here the accuracy is a little bit lower. The first quite obvious application is in media. The media is a very important part of each of our days and it's incredible how many things it flashes at us on a daily basis. That being said, Recognizing some emotional involvement in just really small things can make a big difference to how a brand can or cannot communicate properly. Now I would like to show you three case studies from different backgrounds. The first one is from TV environment. At the very beginning they did a pilot testing of the recycled show Golden Times on STV, which is the Slovak television, where the first guest was Milan Lasica, a very famous Slovak actor. It turned out that Milan Lasica as the first guest was actually the most important thing about the whole program. Whenever his face was shown, all the joys went up. And so, based on that research, they made Milan Lasica a permanent guest. The next thing was also very interesting. They thought that by some interaction with music, they would cheer the whole thing up, but the opposite was true. The people were like, Oh my god, they are annoying us with this music here. So, they deleted those musical intersections. And they were also much better at doing the post-production or the production that they were doing before, and the whole thing was more storyline. So, this was an example of a suggestion that we gave to the television. And based on that, the numbers are quite interesting, you know, to see how from episode to episode the completion of the program has grown. It means that I, as a viewer, will turn it on and see it through the end. It was very important because it meant that those intersections were actually really important for that particular program. Another quite interesting case study are the three components of media space covered by TV, influencers and advertising. Influencers are interesting because they have their own audience and often they think they know it. And it was really nice to see their reactions when they realized they actually didn't know it and to see how grateful they were when we were able to offer them other helpful advice. So they were surprised that even though they knew that their audience was made up of gamers, they didn't know how big gamers they were. They knew they were young people, and so it's clear that when they saw something that resembled the movie Matrix, they did not associate the movie at all with any of the stimuli that was in the video. But okay, we knew that, we knew that they were too young to know that. But when Dota was mentioned, which is a very gamer thing, strangely enough, they knew what it was. And so, even though they were young people, they were intense gamers. As a result, that target group was much better crystallized for products and brands that are dedicated to gaming. And even though they weren't the people known on Twitter who, you know, play from morning to night, their target audience was exactly the same. So, it mainly helped them to be able to reach out more deeply to collaborations with development studios or other products that have something to do with gaming. This was something they wouldn't have discovered without us. You know, they wouldn't have had the chance to know that their audience was this gaming involved. Another interesting thing is the testing of the ad with BUB, which is the largest, which is the second largest Slovak bank. It was a simple video that was supposed to have some branding at the end. But as soon as they put the last scene in the colors of the bank, people immediately switched somewhere else. When we told them to let that storyline run and that we would add some branding on top of it, suddenly people were able to finish watching it and they were even engaged. Later at the end, we interviewed them and asked them if they remembered the brand. In the second version, 
most of them did remember it, while in the first one almost nobody did. Uh, I think it was about 120 people who saw each video and we did four test runs. Another interesting thing we were able to advise them, which really lifted their engagement, is that they didn't have any scenes for girls. Even though there was an all boys group having fun, they were really missing on some female things, let's say. Once they were able to talk about some of the things girls like better, you know, some jokes, it lifted their engagement by almost 20%. This way, they were able to broaden the whole scope of the campaign and get, and get much better execution data, which is very important, especially when a bank has decided to communicate their product only through influencers, which I think is quite a risky decision because it's, it's really hard to measure. The last case study is my favorite because we were part of how the brand and the first communication image were created. The video we measured consisted of these mini signs that were that changed while there was a ball bouncing. It was cow. The last case study is actually my favorite because we were part of how the brand and the first communication image were created. The video we measured consisted of these mini signs that changed while there was a ball bouncing. It was quite long, lasting about a minute, which is quite a long time considering that there were only headings. And you really could tell what people liked in the way they reacted. Basically, the most interesting group for this brand were women of working age, let's say from 30 to 60 years, because it's a brand of Botox clinics that open in Ireland and America, but it's actually all over the world. There was an interesting phrase that said, not everything is gone with the wind. This sentence made all women of the right age laugh. You know, it meant that not everything is over yet. And they built the whole branding on that idea. It wasn't built on beautiful Photoshop models at a young age. Instead, in the campaigns, they used women in their 40s and 50s. And it was a very brave moment, I must say. Even though people like to look at someone much more beautiful, their idol, they decided to take the natural communication route. And I think it paid off for them. It really was a very interesting moment when we could enter into the beginning of thinking about how to build advertising campaigns. And the moment we got into different institutions from advertising agencies to communicating directly with clients to research agencies, we got into political marketing and the way how we make decisions is built on emotions. Emotions are like a label of our brain experiences and as we grow they give us a point of view and a way to make decisions. The human brain decides emotionally first and then rationalizes it. So this is how decision making works. The defining moment for me was when it came to whether we were going to campaign for the Mexican president who ended up winning it because I found him unsympathetic and we said we weren't going to do it. But in that moment, I realized how much it matters whether I or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, I'm not comparing myself to him, of course. I mean, those people who have a reach for deep tech and deep understanding, really that kind of intimate understanding, how we can really be sensitive to what you really like, um, no, not what you put on a questionnaire, but what you really like. It made me realize how dangerous that is and actually whether I myself am willing to take on some of the responsibility or whether I want to pursue such things or make decisions about such things. And so the company Emotion ID with its functionality for ad agencies or research I think has pretty much killed it with this. Because one of the basic tactics of all fake news is emotion. Facebook is so widespread because it can read and use our emotions correctly. Maybe not immediately read them off your face, although in the case of iPhones it can. It's really hard to think we are not being manipulated because we really are being manipulated and we are being manipulated a lot. And to me, 
that's the code of ethics. How much I want to deliver the right message or some nice product with the right marketing and achieve something interesting versus how it can be misused for something unfair. Let's put it that way. I wanted to deliver a moment of reflection with this slide. Whether it is not a coincidence that regulation is lagging behind the way technology is advancing. Whether our education systems are slowed down in not knowing these things on their own. We don't know how much we can be manipulated. And I think the result of how this data can be misused is too much power in the hands where, maybe, where it maybe shouldn't be. And consequently, a fairly misguided population comes out of that in fairly hateful moments and I think that that's dangerous. In the following slides, I would like to give you an idea of what we have done further with our technology. Here's an example of what tracking looks like. My colleague in the video really exaggerates the emotions, so they are high up to 100% levels, but we could also capture some micro emotions within microseconds when they spill over your face, even if you're trying to, to hide them or to not do that. And let's take a look at where we found applications for our micro technologies in healthcare and specifically in mental health. What we have found is that we don't want to describe what a person feels on what stimulus and move that stimulus along. But we found in the course of doing trials with respondents, you know, particularly the same ones as I was talking about the lady earlier that she had Botox uh, in between the process. And with others, we were able to detect good and bad days. The good and bad days were interesting because their intensity of emotionality was completely different, their engagement was completely different, and also their attention span was completely different. When they were stressed, they couldn't look at the screen and it was obvious that they were hectic moments. Which of course may seem like I can see that in the person, but the bottom line is that not every day and every moment the person who cares about you or a psychologist can look at you. And that's where our solution is good for, calibrating your normal behavior and finding the moments when you don't feel good. This is how we use our technology, which works in young children to detect the first mental problems or disorders. For example, autism is very evident on emotions because for them, emotions are absolutely incompre incomprehensible. So that's why they, are, they also seem strange to us because they can't read them or show them. So this is the use with little children. And during pandemic, we also found a use with older people, a, a way to help them. They are a sensitive group of people who had to be isolated and that isolation is not easy. We brought that moment that your grandmother is sad, text her now. So we sort of helped the family to interact with that person or the senior at the right time. So that's an example of how it works. The purple zone is where we consider the behavior normal and then any other alarm or any other behavior is marked in red. That's when it sends a text message either to the kids, family members or doctors. It's a new moment in our company that we have decided to address. One of the main reasons for me was the moral question of whether or not I can somehow muddle through in this business. And fortunately, we found such a nice product in mental health, which is a very important topic for me. Thank you for your attention.